Hello and welcome to another episode of Hidden Archives. Today I'm on location at Fort Concho in San Angelo, Texas. Established in 1867, Fort Concho was built at the confluence of the North Concho River and Middle Concho River to protect frontier settlements and counter hostile threats in the area, including the Lipan Apache, but especially the Comanche. Soldiers from the fort also patrolled and mapped West Texas. A settlement grew up just across the river from the fort. Uh, initially, it was just called Over the River, but soon came to be called San Angelo. This was later changed to San Angelo when it became incorporated as a town in the 1880s, uh, due to uh, San Angelo being more grammatically correct. The fort was comprised of at least 40 buildings from native limestone and covers about 1,600 acres. At full strength, the fort supported 400 to 500 military and support staff. It remained an active outpost until 1889 and was home to the famed 10th Cavalry Regiment, the famed Buffalo Soldiers. Fort Concho stands among the best preserved posts of its era west of the Mississippi. The fort is now operated by the city of San Angelo. It has period interiors and special displays and it also hosts events from time to time. Race of Living History weekends um, here at Fort Concho. Concho is one of the most amazing, um, both original and reconstructed Army Indian posts in Texas. On the exterior of the fort, there is a large parade ground. Across the other side are houses which used to house the officers and their families. On the near side, we see the barracks, as well as other buildings that were used for various purposes. Here we can see reconstructed a typical enlisted men's quarters. Usually there would be quite a few uh, men, maybe 20 or so, within each barracks. Hello, I'm here speaking with Robert Bruni who works here at Fort Concho. Uh, Robert, uh, what can you tell us about the fort? When, uh, why was it set up in this location? Uh, specifically, it was begun in 1867 after the Civil War. It was put in this location specifically because there's a good water supply. Um, prior to the Civil War, forts had been basically defensive in nature, uh, mostly infantry. After the Civil War, they come back with a much more offense-minded attitude and a lot more cavalry, and that requires a lot more water. So Port Chadburn, for example, just did not have an adequate water supply to support such a garrison. Here they did. So this, when it was begun, there was, Port Chadburn was the nice closest permanent building. Okay, so Fort Chadburn didn't have enough water at its location, but this was a good spot because of the abundant water supply. Okay. Well, what can you tell us about the Buffalo Soldiers? Um, well, during the Civil War, the uh, military raised black regiments. And they were successful, so after the war they wanted to keep them. Uh, when it comes to Sherman specifically, wanted to have an avenue for black soldiers to enter the army. So they kept certain regiments. Eventually it was the 9th and 10th Cavalry, the 24th and 25th Infantry, and they were reserved for black soldiers only. White twice need not apply, except for the officers who were white, but the soldiers were black. Okay, now Colonel Gerson is said to have been one of the more famous commanders of the fort here. Uh, what can you tell us about him? Well, he started out, prior to the Civil War, he was a music teacher in, I think, Illinois. During the Civil War, he led arguably the most successful cavalry raid of the war during the Grant's campaign for Vicksburg. And so after the war, he decided to stay in the Army, and he was given command of the 10th Cavalry, and they went up first to uh, what was then Indian Territory and founded Fort Sill, which was, the reservation was centered around Fort Sill. And then he and Colonel McKenzie and the 4th Cavalry traded posts. And Gerson came here and spent a long time here at Fort Concho and uh, led the army in its last campaign against Victoria. And the house over there was his quarters, and a little piece added on to the side was his office. We're talking about the house on the other side of the yeah. of the uh, parade field there. Okay. Um, now uh, you said the last campaign against uh, who was that again? Victorio. Victorio, and that was 
1881. Okay. Uh, who was Victorio? He was a, an Apache war chief. Okay. And uh, they were in Mexico and looking to come back into the United States. And Grierson sent the army by this time had done a good job of mapping the area so they knew where all the water holes were. And he staked out all the water holes so when the Apache scouts came, Every place that might get water had soldiers there, and they gave up and went back into Mexico. Okay. Uh, now, how about the Nimitz Hotel incident in 1881? What happened with that? Well, there was a, a white guy in town, a civilian, shot a black soldier. And the Army, okay, the Army always has factional rivalries, cavalry and infantry black and white, uh, that sort of thing. But, you know, like brothers, once somebody comes in from outside to bother you, <laughs> and you band together. So units of the 10th Cavalry and units of the white 16th Infantry who put on um, shoe polish, went to town and kind of tore it up because they were, they were under the impression that this guy had been arrested and then let go. Mm -hmm. uh, that was not correct, but, yeah, it was a it was a problem they called the Texas Rangers. Right. And they said to Colonel Grierson, uh, we want you to turn over those guys. He said, No. Okay. So they said, Okay, we'll just wait here right off he said, Get off my post. <laughs> mm. You don't have authority on my post. He said, we'll wait right outside the post and rest that video comes off. Well the next group that came off was a whole company of tests fully armed and did not get arrested. An interesting aside with that commander of those that ranger the rangers that came then uh, was actually had been a company commander of the uh, 17th uh, Charlie Company of the 17th Cavalry Texas Cavalry Regiment during the during the war, oh. and uh, he was actually the company commander for my great great grandfather oh, okay. Moses Buckner, yeah. So um, I recall reading that soldiers in the fort didn't buy a lot of goods from the stores in San Angelo, but they did sometimes trade some of their flour for beef or, uh, with ranchers in the area. Was flour hard to come by in those days? Everything was hard to come by in those days. Uh, the main army supply depot was close to San Antonio. San Antonio. And everything came out here by wagon, so... Mm -hmm very expensive. That's one of the reasons Fort Contra closed was the railroad came here. Right. And you could get stuff much easier, but you could also move troops much easier. Right. So, uh, but the Army had contracts with local beef people and with uh, Bismarck Farms for fresh vegetables. So what was the typical food for soldiers here? <laughs> Beans and a heart attack were pretty common. Um, cheese. Me. What was the hygiene like? Uh, did they have a bathhouse or something at the port, or did they just have to go down to the river? Yeah, pretty much go down to the river. Pretty much go down to the river. Uh, okay. They had a little hip as you sit in. Yeah, people did not wash as much as they do today. True. Okay. What was in that typical kit issued to a soldier here? Were they issued more than one uniform, or if not, how'd they handle washing their clothes and stuff? Well, the washing of the clothes was done by uh, laundresses. Okay. And laundresses were the only women of any official standing in the U.S. Army. Okay. Part of the deal. And uh, enlisted man paid a dollar a month for his laundry, and uh, an officer paid four dollars a month for his laundry. Oh, okay. Uh, you got a base issue, but anything after that you had to pay for yourself. Okay. How much time was typically spent in garrison by a soldier here as opposed to being out on patrol? Did that vary? Yeah, it varied by season. Uh, uh, October or fall was when the Indians came through. I see you wanted to be pretty alert then. Summer was when you would go hunt. Um, the Army was able to operate in the winter better than the Indians. And so Sheridan and some others figured that out and started doing winter campaigns, which the soldiers hated. We're in Texas, it's not supposed to be cold, but right. yeah, it is. <laughs> <laughs> okay, any other interesting stories or anecdotes you can share about the fort? 
Yeah, it was uh, one of my favorite ones was a Buffalo soldier in the 10th Cavalry named Ellis. And he took sick and went into the hospital. <coughs> Excuse me, and uh, died. Well, they had a morgue, which is a, a little two room building. Oh, I think I've heard hospital. this story before. <laughs> yeah, and, go ahead. Uh, because the Irish were made up the bulk of the white soldiers. And the blacks both like to hold weights. And uh, so they put the body in the back room and they would sit in the front room close to where he's a drink. But during the night, Ellis got up. Mm -hmm. And uh, his friends opened the door to see what the noise was and saw Ellis getting up and the part of the building through windows that were not open. <laughs> and Ellis made a complete recovery and. Uh, but life was never the same. He came back to his barracks, and as he walked in one door, the whole company left through the other door and said, Alice, you're dead. <laughs> uh, and he, he got out of the army, settled here in San Angelo, lived a long life, died at 90 something, mm -hmm. buried in Fairmount Cemetery right over here. Mm. Hello. So, one of the events mentioned in my interview there at Fort Concho. Uh, was the Nimitz Hotel incident, which occurred here in San Angelo in 1881. Uh, what happened was there was a young Buffalo soldier who was shot and killed by a local rancher. And this occurred around the Nimitz Hotel here in San Angelo. The Nimitz Hotel uh, at the time was located on the corner of Chadburn and uh, Concho Street. As you can see now, I'm at the corner, and across the way there you can see a large building. That building is located at where the Nimitz Hotel once stood. Uh, now the Nimitz Hotel, the one that stood there in 1881, it ended up burning down not long after that. Uh, still in the early 1880s. Uh, another hotel was then built in its place. That one burned down in 1902. Uh, it was it was then replaced by a third hotel that then burned down in the 1920s. <laughs> That's when the current hotel was built there, and it was in uh, it was in business until the 1980s when it was closed due to not being up to code for the fire standards, and it has stood vacant ever since. 